to another episode of Ask Seek and Knock. We have a new hour today, well today, from now on actually. And uh, well, my name is Ina Carr. I'll be the host of the show. And this is a show where we will talk about anything about the Catholic Church, about faith, about uh, spiritual life, about prayer, about saints. And we actually are switching now. And in our first part of the episode, we will have my husband, Dr. Thomas Carr, who's a theologian, a philosopher, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, well, before we talk, uh, why don't we open up in prayer? Would sure. You, would you do that, please? Yeah. Welcome to everybody who's watching. And, and then we have Father Ignatius later. Father on Ignatius half, will join us in the second in half the second of the show. Half. So Father and I are switching, switching time slots here. Okay. So let's, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come to you this evening. And we thank you for this time that we have that you've carved out for us, Lord, through Marie Vision, to share some thoughts about faith and life with our members who are listening in. And we ask your divine blessing to be upon our words, upon our thoughts, and upon our every feeling that goes connected with these. We turn to our Mother Mary. We ask that uh, you would take us up into your immaculate heart, that you would protect us, that you would watch over us, and that every word that flows from our lips would edify your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we have uh, a topic that you would like to uh, share, which is a book that you've been reading lately. Yes. Could you tell us about that? Yes. So um, I normally read books in the area of theology and philosophy. Um, but I was feeling the need to um, reconnect with my, my spiritual life. My spiritual life is largely shaped by the practices that you and I share as lay Dominicans. So the rosary, the office, the reading of scripture, um, daily mass and uh, adoration. But the reading of spiritual works is also an important part of the mm -hmm. spiritual life and the spiritual path. And so... Uh, I was at this place in my life, and I won't go into all the details why. <laughs> you can. <laughs> well, no, it's just going to bore everybody. <laughs> my life is very uneventful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to me, I it agree. seems like an amazing thing, but <laughs> it really is very boring from the outside. <laughs> but uh, all that's to say that I, I picked this book off the shelf, and it was one that I had, had been kind of catching my eye. I suggested that to you. And you had suggested it to me as well. Um, and I felt like the Lord had something to say mm -hmm. to me through it. It is written by um, a Jesuit priest from the 18th century, mm -hmm. the time when the Jesuits were still faithful and devout. <laughs> uh, there are There's many, still a lot of There are still a lot of great faithful yeah. Jesuits, of course. His name is uh, Jean-Pierre de, de Cassade, a French Jesuit priest. He died in 1720, uh, 1750 and he aged uh, 75 or so. And we don't really know a whole lot about his life. Um, his life, like mine, very uneventful. <laughs> you don't know that. I don't know that. <laughs> uh, so he, he was a um, rector of a college for Jesuit seminarians. He was a spiritual director for the seminarians and he spent a season of his life as a spiritual director for a group of nuns. I don't know what order they were a part of, but uh, he served as their spiritual director and he gave conferences to them on a regular basis. And the book that I'm looking at here, The Sacrament of the Present Moment, which sometimes goes by a different title, um, Abandonment, Abandonment to the Divine Providence is another title, it's the same book but a different way of describing I think before you continue, I want to just share with the audience, yeah. that book helped me in 2020. Uh, when I had the worst dark night, the worst. Yeah. Like seven things went wrong, and then COVID. And but COVID. that book really upheld me. Wow. Yeah. And what flowed out of that year was our move here to Ave Maria. That's so. right. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen when you read this book. <laughs> so... Um, so Kassad, again, he, he was giving these conferences, these regular conferences. He, the only writings that we have that are from his own hand are some letters. We have those. Mm -hmm. But these conferences were 
were written down by the nuns as they were receiving them, and those notes became the basis for this book. So one of the problems in reading de Cassade's writing, and especially this book, is that they've gone through several stages to get to this stage, right? They, they started as oral teachings to nuns. They became notes on those teachings. Those notes were transformed into a, a manuscript of some kind in the French. The French had to be translated into English, and at every step along that, those, that way, um, things got changed a little bit and some wording got changed and so when you're reading the English you, you kind of think boy those two sentences don't go together very well <laughs> or he's about to tell me this really important thing I'm really looking forward to learning what he has to say and then you read two paragraphs and there's nothing there oh. on what he has to say what you want him to say so there are some problems reading um, reading the writings because of the form in which it has come down to us Translation. yeah and apparently there was an early version that got into English that was written by someone who wanted to seriously change de Cassade's teaching to move it in a sp special direction and so he inserted a lot of material and played down some other material and it wasn't really his own work. So with that, with that as caveat, there's a second uh, caveat that we have to understand before reading de Cassade's work and that is that during his time, the late 17th century and the first half of the 18th century, there was a movement in the Catholic Church, especially in Catholic spirituality, that um, falsified some of the understandings of the Catholic spiritual life. The movement is called quietism. quietism. You've heard of it, I think? Isn't that Protestant? That's not Protestant. No, it's not Protestant. Um, it, it, it has some similarities with the Protestant tradition, and so that's part of the problem. Puritan, maybe. Some Puritans, that's right. Um, quietism, it was started by this Spanish mystic, Jesuit mystic, named Molinos, who um, taught that when you progress in the spiritual life, you can rise up in stages, and when you get to the highest stage, you're no longer yourself, you are, in fact, a conduit for the will of God. That God's will is your will. That your self is no longer yourself. It is now God's self living in you. Your thoughts, your heart, the actions that you perform, not really you doing it, it's God doing it through you. In such a way that you don't really even exist. Oh, okay. And it's taught that when you reach that high level of perfection that you cannot sin. There's no sin in that state. Mm. So that, that came to be known as quietism because the, the, to, to get there, to get to that highest stage, you have to quiet your own will. You have to quiet your ambition, your, your drive, your personality, your character, and allow God to replace all of that with himself. Mm. You know, now that's very, very close to traditional Catholic spirituality, where we are taught to yeah. sacrifice ourselves, to uh, don't, you know, not to think of our own desires, to put those on the side and allow God to, to show us how to live and what to say and so on. But true Catholic spirituality is always that as a form of cooperation between myself and God. Right? We're partners. Yeah. God does not call us slaves. He calls us sons. Right. So we partner with God as a loving father who takes us and doesn't destroy our nature, but raises our nature up the way God always designed it to be. Perfect our nature. Perfects our nature. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So we still are very much alive, very much a self, yeah. but we become a self in its better form because of what God's doing in us. And so our decisions then are much more in line with God's will, but they're not God's will himself. Our thoughts are in line with God's thoughts, but they're not God's thoughts. They are our thoughts in line with God's thoughts, if that makes sure. sense. Okay, so there was that, that heresy going on, and uh, de Cassade got, um, got implicated in it. And for two years, he was not allowed to teach because his writings, whether they were in fact his own writings or whether they were part of this 
reinterpretation of his writings, I don't know. But he was uh, reprimanded by the church for a couple of years because they thought he was a quietist. So yeah, we have to be very careful about that because there are um, still movements alive today that will say something similar. Yeah. So um, anyway, so Descartes' book uh, is how to get into that place where we become uh, cooperators with God, how our will can be surrendered to His, how we can fully surrender to, to what God wants to do in our lives and how He wants us to live. So I just wanted to uh, share some little bits of the book with you all. Uh, so Descartes talks about three levels of God's will. The first level is the level that we are all uh, uh, required to submit to, and that is his objective will. God's objective will is his will as expressed through the precepts of the church, the Ten Commandments, the, the, the scripture verses where moral principles are at work, like the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's very clear, it's very objective. Everybody can read those things and know exactly how we ought to live. Mm -hmm. We ought to go to Mass on Sunday, we ought to say confession regularly, we ought to receive the Eucharist as often as we're in a state of grace, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. God's objective will, our duty is simply to submit and to obey that, the, that part of God's will. Then he talks about a second level of will that is a little more difficult to experience, but it's his subjective will, which is his will for our lives in particular, you and me as individuals, and it's the will that he speaks into us. So God, through the Holy Spirit, resides within us, right? And as Holy Spirit is within us, Holy Spirit is wanting to help us live the best life that we can. Help us be as obedient to God as possible. Help us to make the right choices. So God does that through the Holy Spirit by prompting us to make the right choices. You know, there's a little, that little inner voice, yeah, right? The gut, the gut The feeling. gut feeling. The gut feeling that you just know is God. Yes. And you know, sometimes we all have to admit, sometimes it's easy to obey that voice because it lines up with something that we kind of like anyway. And there are a lot of times a lot when of times it's, not. it's not so easy, no, no. not yeah. so easy. God, God tells us to fast on a day when we really don't want to fast. Mm -hmm. God tells me to reach out to somebody that I've had a struggle with and maybe to confess that I was in the wrong. That's not so, I, yeah, I know it doesn't <laughs> happen very often. <laughs> Actually, my wife and I, we have this little thing we say that uh, we always agree we never fight because she always thinks I'm wrong and I always think I'm wrong as well. <laughs> so we always agree. <laughs> so we always agree. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, that little voice inside of us, that's God's subjective will. And that's also something we have to first discern that will, that it is God's voice. And then secondly, we also need to submit ourselves to it and obey. And then he talks about a third level of will. And this is where, t in my mind, it gets a little bit confusing. I'm totally on board with him as far as the objective will of God goes requiring our obedience, re regarding the subjective will of God, which he rightly says, I think, requires us to be very present in the moment. One of his counsels is don't dwell on the past, don't project ahead into the future. The past is no longer real, it's gone. The future hasn't happened yet, it also doesn't have reality. The only moment of time that has reality is right now, present moment. And so one of his uh, disciplines is to challenge us to be present in the moment, to see it as a kind of sacrament. The present moment is a sacrament. Maybe better to term it as a sacramental, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we hear God's voice within, in the present moment, telling us, prompting us, encouraging us, cautioning us against doing something and our duty is to hear and obey, right? He has a, a, a beautiful um, illustration of, of this when he talks about uh, the 
the craftsman who picks up a tool like a hammer and uses that tool in the right way. He says this, um, for obedience to God's undefined will, that, that's his subjective will within us, right? It's not objective and clearly defined. It's something that we have to discern. Obedience to God's undefined will depends entirely on our passive surrender to it. We put nothing of ourselves into it apart from a general willingness that is prepared to do anything or nothing. Like a tool that though it has no power in itself, when in the hands of the craftsman, can be used by him for any purpose within the range of its capacity and design. Whereas our obedience to the declared and defined will of God, that's the objective will of God, consists in the normal course of vigilance, care, attention, prudence, and discretion, uh, we leave God to act in everything, this is the subjective will of God, reserving for ourselves only love and obedience to the present moment. Mm. So again, as I'm reading it, I think you can kind of hear if you're sensitive to language that the writing is a little strange. Mm. Grammatically and sometimes the meaning isn't always very clear and I think this is part of the problem with okay. his book that it started off as lectures, it became notes, notes were changed into a manuscript, manuscript had to be translated, there were problems with the translation, you know, and on and on. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the, the second form of will. And then there's this third form of will, which, I, now I haven't finished the book, so I can't really say whether this is true or not, but it's, um, it's a little bit uh, murky in my mind. <laughs> murky. <laughs> this third form of will is a little bit murky. Let me see if I can find... Um, Yeah, so there are several places where he tries to describe what it's like to be in this, in this third, at this third level of obedience to the present moment. And he says this, when God lives in souls, there is nothing of themselves left, save mm. what comes from his inspiration. Sounds like quietism. Sounds like quietism, <laughs> exactly, exactly. By the way, here's, here's a, a very good example of how the writing of this book is a little bit awkward. Chapter 2, I got very excited about reading Chapter 2 because the title is How to Arrive at the State of Self-Surrender and How to Act Before Reaching That State. I thought, well, I want to know that. I want to know how do I get to a place of self-surrender because that's kind of the key, right, mm -hmm. to obeying, obeying God's will. And what should I do when I'm not there yet? Right? So I read the whole chapter and it's nothing about nothing. that. <laughs> nothing about that. Maybe it's in chapter three. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe, yeah. So I don't know what, what went wrong there, but... Hmm. Um, Is there a different translation? Well, I think, I think there are. And there, there are more... I, I read the other one, not that one. Not yeah, there's that, a real not, thick one. Yeah, that's the one I read. Yeah. Maybe it's different. It's a different title. It might be. It might be. This, yeah. this might be more of a streamed down version. Yeah, um, it's thicker. Yeah. There was one other passage. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is how we are to belong wholly to God in order to do his will fully. <clears throat> and again, the English grammar is a, a little awkward here, to say the least. We'll, we'll finish with this. So, a state in which one discovers how to belong wholly to God through the complete and total assignment of all rights over oneself, over one's speech, actions, thoughts, and bearing, the employment of one's time and everything related to it, there remains one single duty. It is to keep one's gaze fixed on the master and to be constantly listening so as to understand and hear immediately to obey his will. Nothing so well as illustrates this condition as that of a servant whose sole duty lies in obeying instantly whatever orders his master may give him. And I just want to say, just in closing, that <clears throat> there is a, a very legitimate um, teaching in the Catholic tradition, and especially in the lives of many saints, that we are indeed servants of the King, yeah. the King of Kings. So, and we are, uh, as servants, as, as his knights in his army, 
we are to get on bended knee to say, Master, I'm at your beck and call. You tell me what to do. That's certainly a, a valid way. But again, I would just add that the traditional Catholic understanding of that is that we still retain um, our, our personal dignity as human persons, as human selves. That self does not disappear. It does not disintegrate. It's not something that we should uh, annihilate, as you might find in Eastern mystical traditions. It is something that God comes in and orients and aligns in a way, in, uh, in such a way that we become truly servants of the Lord. Well, we become also more like Christ. Yeah. So in a way, it's not servant, you become the fully adopted sons and daughters. Yeah, that's Father. right. That's right. So you're a slave, but slave of love. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're a loving son, love. a loving yes. daughter yeah. who will do anything for anything. the father. Exactly. Yeah. You just tell me what to do, Dad, and I'll yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the attitude. But you're still, you know, your character, your personality, yeah. your, your unique um, yeah. shape in the world is yeah. still there. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. And I don't think Kassad is actually teaching anything against that, but mm -hmm. it can be understood in that way. So that's the only danger. Yeah. Well, you we need to finish the book for next week, then you can tell us. I can then tell the you. The ending. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. I think we're out of time, huh, yeah. this segment? Okay. Okay. I think we still have one minute. Oh, it's gone. <laughs>